Hi, hon. Can I have my key? J.D., hi, hon. I thought you were coming into town in the middle of the week. Uh, afternoon, ma'am. Well, what do you think? I think we need to have a beer. No, no, no. I mean, I mean about her. About who? What are you talking about? My girl. You mean that was your girl? Mm -hmm. Oh, ain't she wonderful? Mm -hmm. that, that's Margie, the one you're going to bring out to supper? Mm -hmm. You didn't even act like you knew her. Yeah. Yeah, I know. It uh, sometimes happens to me when I get around her. I don't know. I just kind of get all tied up inside. <laughs> oh, ain't she something, though? <laughs> uh, Joe, uh, better give us three beers. <laughs> Waiting, you know. Disgustingly provincial. Oh, come off here. Come on now, let's get a move on with that baggage. Oh, thank you. Oh, there you are, my man. You have uh, reservations for the Duke of London and his entourage? Let's have a little service now. Oh, madam. Uh, your hand. Hmm? I kiss the hand of the most beautiful... Uh, Lady, I've seen since I've been in this beastly country. Here, here. Hold your horses now, Dookie. It's the men what pays our wages, and it's the ladies what takes them away. You understand? Come on, let's go in the pub. Me gully's fair crying out for a nip. Joe, have some drinks for the boys. Did Adam come in with you? No, I left a couple of days ago, Roy. I had to make a little trip to San Francisco. Make way for the Duke of London. All right, you blokes, now out of the way. Give the Duke some elbow room. Drinks for the house. You'll have to get in line, stranger. Drinks are bought for this round. The Duke of London waits for no one. Come, fellow, a bottle. You, a drink on the Duke of London. I'm sorry, mister, but uh, little Joe already bought me a drink. Children, may I have your attention, please? The Duke of London, champion of the British Empire, on a world tour, challenges all comers. Any man who stands four rounds will be paid $500 American money. Do you dare, Yankees? Yankees, nation of dolts and cowards. Ah, knock it, Bobo. We'll take a pound or two from them, don't you worry. You know, you really showed that crowd something down there. You was real prime. Look at this filthy place. Virginia City. Nothing but a foul pig pen. Ah, oh, come off it. We seem worse. Although I must say, I have never tasted such bad whiskey. <laughs> what I wouldn't give for some good old London ale. And you and your liquor. Well, can't you stop guzzling even for a moment? Why should I? Every man to his own sin, I say. <laughs> well, you could hardly call yourself a man. You're know, like the rest of these donkeys around here who have to wear guns to protect themselves. You'll we'll have to be extremely lucky to get a fight in this town. Uh, you just keep on playing the game, Bobo. We'll get our fight. You know, you've got a knack, you have. I have never known of any one man who could get so many other men hating him in such a short time. You're a marvel. That's what you are. And you know, when they hate you enough, that's where we get our fight. So you go on being your own natural self. You drunken sot. Ah, uh, you can call me names, Bobo, but you can't escape me. Oh, will you shut up? Oh, uh, well, I know you too well. Every time you get like this, it's because of some skirt. 
It wouldn't be the little barmaid you took a fancy to now, would it? You don't suppose she's out playing a little slap and tickle with one of these here American cowboys while the handsome Duke of London is pacing up and down the floor now, do you? <laughs> Now, you leave the women to me, because I handle them a lot better than you handle this filthy rubbish you are drinking. Thanks. Gee, you know, this is, this is just great. I mean, it's just wonderful of you, Mr. Cartwright, to, to go to all this trouble, invite me out for supper and everything. Well, we're very happy to have the opportunity of making your acquaintance, Miss Fuller. J.D. talks so much about you. Uh, will you have some dessert? Hmm? Oh, uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, oh, and, and just call me Marge. Um, everybody does. Uh, honey, do you want some pie? No, thanks, sir. I mean, ma'am. <laughs> well, you boys had quite a time in town, didn't you? This uh, prize fighter... Uh, what did you say his name was? Uh, the Duke of London, Paul. I ain't never seen a Duke before, but they're all like that fella. I don't ever care nothing about seeing another. I wish you'd have been along with us, Pa. This man makes more enemies just walking into a room than anybody I ever saw in my life. Well, you boys did right to ignore him. Well, you should have seen what he did to me, Mr. Cartwright. He stopped me right in the middle of the lobby and grabbed my hand and kissed it. Well, if I'd have known that, I'd have taken a wallop at him. Well... Uh, J.D., hand-kissing in Europe is, uh, is quite common. Probably just a gesture. <laughs> Not the way he did it, it wasn't. He looked at me like he owned me or something. Yeah, I should have walloped him. I'm afraid you wouldn't have stood much of a chance, J.D. The man is a professional prize fighter. You know, his fists are considered lethal weapons by law. Well, I got a couple of lethal weapons of my own. Now, you hold on there. Don't you get any big ideas just because you're... Big and strong doesn't mean that you're a match for a professional prize fighter. Just stay away from this duke, or whatever it is that he calls himself. No amateur can stand up to a professional. Just keep out of his way. I'm afraid we're not being very polite to our guest. Oh, that's all right. Don't mind me. I kind of enjoy talking about him. I sure never met a man like him before, and I've met a lot of them. You sure got a nice place here. You know, I... I never lived in a house in all my life. Me neither. You will, J.D., Whenever you get married, uh, we'll take over the house down by the forks. J.D., why don't you take Marge outside, show around the place? Oh, could we, J.D.? I'd love to see it. Well, it's pretty dark out there. I don't know what you could see. Well, there's a full moon. She ought to be able to see enough. You go ahead. Uh, the boys will clean up the dishes. Clean up the dishes? Oh, oh. Yeah, yeah, you... You go ahead, J.D. Well, uh, okay. I was going to bust out laughing right in front of the bus <laughs> Me too, Joe. Old J.D.'s collar was tight. I thought his eyes were going to pop out. Yeah. The thing I can't figure out is how J.D. ever got up and up enough to talk to her in the first place. Yeah. <laughs> well, a gal like that usually starts a conversation herself, Bob. A girl like what? Well, I mean, she's a... Well, she's a dance hall girl. I thought she was very nice. What did you think, Hoss? I, I thought she was very nice. Hey, now, wait a minute. I didn't say I didn't think she was very nice. You, Paul, it's, it's just that old J.D. and her just don't seem to go together for some reason or other. I, I don't know. Well, that's right. That's all I meant by it, Pa. I mean, look, you know how J.D. is. He's he's so shy and everything. And I don't know. I just don't think it'll ever work out. It'll work out. If he loves her. J.D. Huh? Honey, are you afraid of me? <laughs> no, ma'am. Of course not. Uh, now, over there, uh, that's the smokehouse. Here, right? Uh, you can just see the smoke there coming out of the smokehouse. Well, if you're not afraid of me, then why don't you look at me when you talk to me? Well, 
Well, I was looking at the smokehouse. It's J. right over right there. Turn around and look. Yes, ma'am. Now, that's better. You know, I, um, I like what you said in there. I mean, about uh, being willing to fight the Englishman over me. It was a real nice thing to say. Well, I don't think fellas ought to go around kissing girls. When... Well, I mean, if they're not... You know, sometimes a girl doesn't mind being kissed. Well, if you like it, that's, that's your business. But those flashy guys always seem to fool the women, but he don't fool me. I wasn't talking about him, J.D., but at least he wasn't afraid. Who do you think I am? I'm willing to try and find out. Well, I may not be as fancy as that big bag of wind, but I ain't afraid of anything, including him. I bet you're afraid to kiss a girl. Yeah? Uh-huh. Well, are you? No, I'm not. I mean, when I find a girl I want to kiss, she's going to get good and kissed. I'll, I'll get the buggy. <laughs> Pa was right. J.D. is in love with her. How do you know? Oh, if he wasn't, he would have kissed her. Joe, that don't make sense. Now, look, Hoss, I know you're older than I am, but there's certain things I've had a little more experience in than you have. And this just happens to be one of them. Yeah. I bet you he kisses her on the way home. Huh? Oh, yeah, he'll, he'll try to kiss her. She's not going to let him. Bernie Joe, that just don't make sense. Uh, Mr. Duke, well, one does not address a duke as mister, now does one? Well, I'm not anxious to address you in any way, shape, or form. I just want to warn you that... About a... what? I am perfectly capable of taking care of myself. Constable. Now, we don't address a sheriff as a constable now, do we? I just want to point out that as a professional fighter, if you use your fists on anyone, I'm going to jail you for assault with a deadly weapon. Oh, then, in the event that I am attacked, I will not even be allowed to defend myself. Now, you know better than that. Besides, I have a feeling that nobody around here is going to be foolish enough to try a thing like that. So I suggest you just move on your way. Is there anything else before you leave? I think that'll be enough. Still waiting, eh, Bobo? Maybe she ain't coming home tonight. Oh. Now you're giving me the silent treatment. First you knock me about, then you act as if I wasn't here. Well, I am here, Bobo, and you know I'm here. And when you need me, I'll be working late in my office. In other words, in the pub. I, I, I don't know what what came over me. I'm just... I, I'm, I'm sorry it happened. It's all right, Mr. Lambert. It's forgotten. But look, look, I... I don't blame you for slapping me. I, I had it coming, but... Well, you look so... so pretty there with the moonlight in your hair. I just all of a sudden had to kiss you, Marge. I, I'm... You I'm, clumsy fool. You stupid oaf. How dare you even address this lady? Come on, Jenny. Come on. Scum, you coward, you yellow belly. How very brave you are, with a gun pointed at someone who is completely unarmed. Your bravery overwhelms me to such a point that I can no longer tolerate the sight of you. Well, come, my good fellow. Are you not going to pull the trigger? J.D., don't, don't get mixed up with him. Go on home. What 
happen. Surely you have a better man in Virginia City. And if you haven't, well, I suggest you send for one. Because the champion here expects to have a fight in this fair town of yours. Somebody get a doctor. He's hurt bad. Hey, you and Mike take him over to the dock, will you? So you found one, eh? After I told you the law. Well, you're going to the calaboose. Oh, no, he ain't. The yank hit him first. Every bloke here saw it. Is that right, Joe? Yeah, that's right. J.D. hit him first. You had better get these laundered. No hard feelings, Sheriff. Come on in, I'll buy you a drink. I'm sorry, you couldn't have seen me up against a more worthy opponent. One could hardly call it a fight, could one? Of course, I could uh, tell from the outset that you were a woman who uh, needed a man, not a boy. Well, now you've found one. The doctor said he never saw so much damage done by a man's fist. And you know the funny thing? The boys that saw it said it looked like he was just tapping him. I'll tell you something else, too. J.D. ain't the easiest man in the world to take. I seen him take three miners one night in Virginia City single-handed. Roy, what started it? Well, from what I understand, it was that girl Marge. The man's a professional. He ought to be jailed. But J.D. took the first swing. Well, it was good of that very nice girl to let him get his head knocked off on her behalf. I don't care if J.D. did swing first. I'll guarantee you he didn't start it. Come on, Joe. Right. Now, you boys stay right where you are. Hey, stay right here. Look at J.D. Just look at him. You want us to stand here and do nothing? That's exactly what I want you to do. Stand there and do nothing. You can't gun down a man for, for defending himself. Now, J.D. was warned. He was warned. That's my... my fault, Mr. Cartwright. Don't nobody tackle him. It's my fault. I know what he's going to do that to a friend of ours. I agree with Joe, Paul. I don't care who you agree with. You're staying out of it. Oh, Marge. Oh, Marge saw it. She... She saw me make a fool of myself. I... I can never see her again. Paul, I can hurt that man. No. If I can get one hand on him, Paul, I, I can said get... no. Paul, they say he strikes faster than a rattlesnake. Yeah, well, you just wait till I get my hands on him. Just the point, he won't hold still long enough. Yeah, well, if us can't catch him, the two of us can't. Just, right, just, 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 just be quiet and listen to me. Now, first, as I said, J.D. was warned not to mix with the Duke. Second, I've seen professional fighters at work. When I was young, and that wasn't so long ago, I thought I was pretty good, too. Well, one of them showed me how good I was. That's when this was broken for the first time. I couldn't think straight for a week. But, Paul, I'm bigger than you. You may be bigger than I am, but you're no tougher than I was in those days. A man just wasn't designed to be beaten up the way a prize fighter can do it. There's another way, and a better way. Yeah, like what? If he's so anxious to have a fight, we'll get him another professional prize fighter to fight with. Paul, there ain't no professional prize fighters around here nowhere. No, but I know where there is one. I'll send a wire to Adam in San Francisco. There's a fighter there, a great fighter, Heenan, the Benicio boy. We'll pay him to get here as fast as he can. Roy? Yeah? If I ride out the wire, will you take it into town? I'll take it to San Francisco myself if I have to. Still like to get my hands on that Duke. Hey, did you hear that, JD? But I'm gonna get that Venetia boy to take care of the Duke. Yeah, he's a real champ, JD. He'll take care of that Duke. Marge saw it. Marge. Marge saw him make a fool of me. He ain't hearing nothing we're saying. I'd still like to get my hands on that Duke. Now, I'm gonna have to do what Pa said. Of course, that don't mean we can't ride into town tomorrow and sort of break the news about the Benicia boy. I'd like to see the look on the Duke's face when we tell him that. Yeah. I'd sort of like to see that Duke fella myself. Now, wait a minute. 
No, I said we're going to break the news to him, not his neck. Agreed? Agreed, little brother. My what? Your dartboard. How is he? How's Bob J.D.? Up, Bob, got a, a little late to be asking, ain't he? Is he all right? Oh, yeah, he's fine. He's got a busted nose, lost a few teeth. Otherwise, he's feeling just fine. Uh, he, he ain't too pretty. It's going to be a while before he feels like doing any courting again, too. I know everybody thinks that it's my fault. Would you take a message to him? Would you tell him that I want to see him? Well, I don't think he's going to want to see anybody for a while. Especially you. After you excuse us, ma'am, we have some business to take care of. He'll line you up and take you on two at a time, he will. The old blanket town. Because there ain't a man, god, or demon can whip the duke. I trained him from a little whippersnapper I did, and he's the greatest. Got a fist like a rock, and an eye like an orc. So bring on your finest. Uh, well, that's exactly what we intend to do. Bring on the finest. You? <laughs> You're funnier than that bloke last night. <laughs> no, no, not me, little man. I'm talking about the Venetia boy. Venetia boy? Ah, you're trying to fool old Limey. You think I'm drunk, so you're playing jokes on me. No, this ain't no joke, little man. Well, I can't believe it. Well, you can believe it. Benicia boy, Heenan. Hey, uh, Joe, it looks like the little man did all that loud bragging ain't so sure of himself now, don't it? Yeah. Hey, well, it couldn't be that you and, uh, and the Duke are a little afraid of the Benicia boy, could it? Afraid? <laughs> oh, that's a rich one. Afraid? The Duke of London afraid of Benicia, boy. You know what? We've been chasing him all across the country, and now he gets delivered to us on a silver tray. <laughs> oh, wait till the Duke hears this for the news. He'll be pleased fit to bust. <laughs> Oh, that's a rich one. How about a beer? Hmm. In the left again. Show us the old one, too, now. All right, now come in a little. Sure, Nate's is around pretty, don't he? Yeah. Whatever you do, don't show him the big wallop. We gotta make him bet on Benicia boy, remember? That's it. All right, now. Jab. All right, another jab. That's it. All right. Another jab. You didn't get a telegram from Adam yet, did you? Nope. It's been a week. Could be the wires are down again. Oh, no, no. I checked that. What happens if the Benicia boy don't show up? Oh, please. Will you fight him yourself? <laughs> well, the time was when you would. Yeah, well, this isn't the time. I just have to give him that thousand dollar purse. A thousand dollars? That's what I had to guarantee him for the fight. Get those knuckles in there, Bobo. Can I hold his fist? Fancy like too. Knuckles in there. Man, I could really slice a man to pieces. Yeah. One, two. He might slice some men to pieces, but he'd have to hit a whole lot harder than that to cut me up. Yeah, maybe so, but not after a few rounds. Mm -mm. Mm. Well, I'd sure give a pretty to try him, anyhow. Now, when they can come in with a short punch. Hey, look who came to watch the Duke. J.D., honey, are you all right? I'm, uh, I'm fine. Uh, excuse me, I'm, I'm in a hurry. J.D., how you doing? Marge, excuse me, boy. Marge, what's wrong? 
what's right. All you want to do is reach out for something better. Everybody says, no, you stay in your place. Oh, Marge, you know, it doesn't matter what people think. Nothing mattered until J.D. Looks like that's over, too, doesn't it? She sure looked pretty, didn't she? Oh, come on. Don't tell me you're still sweet on her after what happened. Well, it wasn't her fault. Well, I think it's enough for one day. I've got something better to do. Yeah, and I don't know what it is. And it's fair asking for trouble. Women, they'll be the death of both of us. Oh, come on, let's get a beer, huh? That feller's just plain ordinary me. For two cents, I... Come on. Watching a workout? You get out of here. Oh, come, my dear. You might fool the majority of these clods around here, but you don't fool me. I know you and your kind. And I know what's bothering you. Guns. Yeah, like all the men in this godforsaken country, the first thing they turn to is guns. Go on me. There's no need to lie to me. I know you and your kind only too well. You're trying to be better than you really are. But you can't. And deep down inside your heart, you know you can't. And you know you never will. when I get through. taken all I'm going to take from you, you despicable little gutter snipe. J.D. Marge. Well, what happened? It's Duke. He's beating that poor little man. He's going to kill him. Where are they? They're in my room. He broke into my room. Come on, Joe. I'll be right back. J.D., don't leave me. Don't ever leave me. I need you so much. 
You need me? I need you. Why me? Why me? Yeah, I'm an idiot. You want to make it, Lamy? Oh, take it easy now. Uh, I'm just sit real easy down on the bed. I'll be all right. That's See, it. it's just the Duke's way of doing things. My brother don't always see matters my way, yeah. Yeah. You wouldn't have guessed it, would you? Me and the Duke, brothers. Brothers? Yes. You see, his real name's Clarence Simpson. Mine's Harry Simpson. When he was a little tyke, we called him Bobo. The baby he was. Then... They put us in one of them homes. But I got us out of there. Well, you've no idea how I worked and slaved to put that boy through school. See, I, I wanted to make a gentleman out of him. I... Here, Miami, mean, you just take it easy. You might be hurt serious and don't even know it. Now, it... what he said hurts much more than what he done. He can do without me, he says. Just don't seem possible at all. Man could treat his own brother like that. He's always been the same. I taught him, you know. It was kind of the dogs he was. I made him a boxer. You see, that that's how I earned the money to pay for his schooling. Then when I got too old to fight, I I taught him the trade. And now he he says he can do without me. Maybe you're better off without him, Lamy. I taught him good too. I wanted him to be the champ. And he might be if, he, if he'd only leave the skirts alone. But he hurt Marge. He would have. Yes, he would have. He, he's done it before. Oh, I uh, might as well face up to it. He's just no good. So now I'm through with him. You understand? I'm through with him. He thinks he don't need me. He'll find out. Just let him find out. Joe, I don't care what Paul says. This is too much. If it's J.D., then Marge, and now this. Joe? I'm with you. Let's go. Duke? Duke! Well, 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 the Cartwright clan. Have you got the Benicia boy with you? No. But we brought a message. Then deliver it and be on your way. wanted to fight. On a buster, you got it. I'll take you home for money, marbles or chalk, you just name it. challenge him, so the only thing we can do now is to see that everything is conducted properly. You think Hoss can handle him? In a match like this? Well, I hope he doesn't get hurt badly. Yeah, you better study these London prize ring rules. Yeah, how you feeling, Hoss? I feel great, brother. Good. Just lean back, take it easy. That's it. 25 on Hoss against 100 on the Duke. Trail. No, I said I was through with him, and I mean it. I ain't going near his corner, so help me. But i got to warn you, you're going to get hurt mortal bad, boy. I've been hurt before. Well, don't you worry. Hoss can take care of himself. Yeah, give me some of that four-to-one money on Hoss card right here. One hundred on Hoss against... Oh, I don't know. You know, you've been very kind to me, my lad. Take a tip from me. You're going to try and cover that bet because you're going to lose. Yeah, well, don't you worry. My brother knows just what he's doing. Your brother? Yes. Come on, Darren, all right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, let's go. 
You put some of my money on that bed? Under 50 bucks? I'm only half stupid. Come on. Ladies and gentlemen, as you all know, this match is being held against my will. However, since it has been joined, it will be conducted fairly and properly according to the London prize ring rules. The round shall continue until one or both of contestants are down. When a man is down, his seconds may conduct him to his corner for the rest period. Would you like uh, a second assigned to your corner, sir? At the end of 30 seconds, the referee will call time. And the contestants must rise and come to the mark. Now, either man failing to tow the mark at the end of eight seconds, after the referee calls time, shall be deemed defeated. The judgment of the referee will be final and absolute. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you all know the referee, your sheriff, Roy Coffey. <laughs> You men have heard the rules. Timekeepers ready? The contestants will tow that mark. Ready? Time! I get it. Jag, you gotta get inside him. Hit yeah. him in the stomach. You're gonna yeah. hurt him. All right. He's, he's hitting me that funny little old elf. I'm gonna get him first with it this time.
I think you had enough. If I was right, you can't stay in there with a professional. Uh, he's gonna get a bunch of me, Joe. I'm gonna get some of him. I wonder if that's the way you want it. It's me, Bobo. It's me, all right. He's a fair ball. Like hitting a brick wall. Well, he's too strong for you. You've got to move around. Stay away from him. Oh, I don't know anymore, Harry. Oh, just stick it out there. Keep the old flag flying. I missed you, Harry. You did. I'm no good with her, you. Hey! We'll go get him! One. You just get up there. Two. Turn the line. Three. And give them the best you've got. Five. Six. Seven. Bless you, Bobo. A new champ. Way to go, Hoss. Hoss, how do you feel? Good going, Hoss. I, I knew you could do Good it. Good going, Hoss. I left him. You beat the champ. Oh. What are you driving at, son? He was... He was all alone. Oh, what a fuck. Well, I'll give it a little bit, boys. Boys, let's get it. Hey, brother. We are here to settle our account, sir. Harry, will you please pay the gentleman? Yes. Here you are, Governor. One thousand American dollars. Well. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, Paul, uh, if you're going to show him the, uh, you know. Oh, yes. Well, I, I almost forgot. I received a uh, telegram from my son in San Francisco. It says, uh, Venetia boy will not fight you in Virginia City. But he would be happy to meet you in San Francisco. Yeah, that Bobo? We got the big one. God, blimey. <laughs> Mr. Cartwright? Oh, Mr. Cartwright, I, I was just showing my... Oh, pardon me. That's all right, J.D., go ahead. What were you going to say? Oh, well, I was just going to say that Marge uh, loves the house. It's wonderful, Mr. Cartwright. I will not ask you to shake hands, but uh, I would like you both to know how really sorry I am. Oh, that's, uh, that's all right. Come on, Bobo. San Francisco and the Benicia boy, and you'll murder him. Well, I don't know about that, but we'll have a good bash at it, won't we, Harry? <laughs> we will and all. Ta-da! You know... When your little ones come along, I hope they're a little smarter than, uh, than those two. Hey, you know, I was just thinking, there's a, there's a fighter in St. Louis, sort of an up-and-coming heavyweight, it's going out on the road. I was just wondering if we worked on that left hook of yours a little bit, if...
Throw me that towel, eh? Where's Pa? He left before daylight, did you hear him? I reckon he's still fretting about little Joe. Yeah, I know. He, uh... He was asking we were driving the horses in yesterday why Joe went to Yuma. You didn't tell him, did you? No sense in spilling the beans at this point. No. Yeah. Even so, I sure don't hate to see Paul so worried. You don't, you don't reckon anything could have happened to little Joe, do you? No, he can take care of himself. Don't worry. Just think how it's going to be when he rides into town and Pa sees what he's brought him. Yeah. I ain't thought of much else all week. Where did it happen? Two days south of here, sir. Coach has got the whole Apache Nation stirred up. Burned our wagon. Give me a souvenir. Apache between here and Yuma. Uh, Reagan, you know anything about little Joe? I don't know, but I'm going to ask him. Hey, you two men. Get him to the company doctor. Be careful. Lieutenant, I... I'd like to ask the scout. My youngest son is in Yuma, and he's two days overdue getting back. But they just told me there isn't a white man between here and Yuma that's left alive now. What you figuring on doing? I'm gonna try to get the armor to send out a patrol to look for little Joe. You're planning on going with him? Yes, I am planning on going with him. In that case, so are we. You two will stay right here and keep an eye on those horses we bought. It's quite enough that one of my sons wouldn't do as he was told. Paul, Adam and me been talking it over, and we think there's some you ought to know. I've a pack of stubborn, mule-headed, stump brain. Uh, I told him once, I told him ten times. Wait here at Tyson Wells, I said. Wait here, I said. But Paul. Oh, no, he's got to run off somewhere. Can't stay put. Does my word mean anything around Paul. here anymore? What? Paul, me and Adam want to tell you something if you'll calm down. I am calm. You're shouting. I'm not shouting. What is it you want to tell me? We want to tell you why Joe went to Yuma. Well, it's about time somebody started telling me something around here. Boy, it was a kind of a secret between Adam and me and Joe and... Now, will you two make sense? We're, we're trying to, Paul. Joe went to Yuma to buy a horse. A horse? Jumping Jehoshaphat. Haven't we bought enough Arizona horses in the last week to keep the Ponderosa overrun with horses for the next ten years? Paul, this wasn't just any horse. It was a... It was a gift for you. A gift? For your birthday. We, uh... We've been planning it since last year. We even rode every, every horse breeder from here to Kentucky. Yeah, you see, we wanted it to be the... greatest horse we could find. We wanted him to... wanted him to say something that... we just couldn't say. What was it you couldn't say? Paul, we, I reckon we, we just didn't know how to say we loved you.
Apache. They destroy everything always. Did you know these people? See. Si. Good man. His wife. Two little girls. They had a good place here. We gotta find some water. How? The Apache are between us and Fort Dyke. Why are so thirsty? And, uh, my young friend is thirsty too. Here, have a drink, a big drink. Now look, I had my share. Well, go ahead, we'll split it. You first. Thanks. I felt like a drown in all this water. Um, maybe we can ride around the Apache. There's no riding around him. Coaches and his men are everywhere. They will not stop until the army stops them. Probably get pretty thirsty waiting for that. Get even thirsty if we try to go back. You should be pretty sorry you left Colonel Green out. No. Wherever the big white one is, that's where I belong. That's all the water you got. Oh, that's all right. I had my share. It's better for him than me. You really think a lot of that horse, don't you? He is my life, amigo. We understand each other, this horse and me. Better to have a horse like this than to be born rich. No, rich or poor will only last another day in the sun. See, si. But the horses won't. Amigo, I know where there is some water. How far is it? Very near. Very dangerous. Perhaps too dangerous. The Apaches, huh? No. Worse. Comancheros, bandits. These men do not fear the Apache. They trade with them. They have a camp in those mountains over there. Sound like real nice playmates. How do you happen to know where the camp is? Because I was once one of them. You were a Comanchero? Some call it that. Some say I was a bandido. But whatever you call it, whenever they catch one, they put a rope around his neck, see? I was caught. It was Colonel Green who cut me down, gave me a job. I have not been back to that camp in the hills since. Well, what chance do you think we have with them? Does the kangaroo mouse have a chance with a rattlesnake? Well, well perhaps a little one. <laughs> Um, our rattlesnake is a man called Sam Wolf. You know that name? Sure, I've heard the name Sam Wolf, but I, I thought it was a legend, not a real man. He is a king here. Cruel, cunning, deadly as a desert. Even Cochise fears him. I wish there was some other way. Well, there's one other way. What one is that, amigo? I ask the Apache for some water. <laughs> well, we go this way to see the bandidos. The Indians are still raiding some isolated ranches and settlements. If they decide to raid Tyson Wells, I'll need every soldier I have here. I'm sorry, but my hands are tied. I appreciate your position, Lieutenant. Good luck. And as soon as I can, I'll put my troops at your disposal. Thank you, Lieutenant. You weren't figuring on leaving without us, were you? I thought I told you two to stay with the horses. 
You hear him tell us that? I don't recall hearing nothing like that. Looks like you're gonna have some company whether you want it or not. If all three of us ride out of here today, it's likely that none of us will ever get back. Our place is with you, no matter what happens. Paul, you, you can't ride out here without us. Don't you understand what I'm trying to tell you? Yes, sir, we understand. But we also understand that little Joe's in trouble. He might even be dead, I, I don't know. But I do know one thing. Whatever's happened to little Joe's happened to all of us. And we're still a family. Yeah. Yeah, we're still a family. Let's go. Don't act surprised. They've been watching us for half an hour. Pretend we're expected. Yeah, that's a little tough to do when somebody's shooting at you. We're safe for a while. They will not harm us, at least not until they take what they can get from us. Who? Have your rifle. <laughs> Delante. Look at that white horse, Sam. Yeah, that's it. Sam, I gotta have that horse. Prettiest animal I ever saw in my whole life. I've seen it before. It's Colonel Green's horse. And if I'm not mistaken, that's Emiliano there with it. Emiliano. Put that thing away, boy. Emiliano was a good man. Might be again with a little persuading. Well, if it ain't my old friend Emiliano, como esta, amigo? This is my friend, Senor Joe Cartwright of Nevada. I'm Sam Wolf. This is my camp here. Not much of a camp, but <laughs> it's all we got. Actually, all we wanted was some water for ourselves and our horses. What makes you think you're gonna get any? You stay out of this. So you want water, huh? That's right. Well, I got water. Only it's kind of hard to come by in this country, you know. If we got money, we're willing to pay for it. What do we want with your stinking money? Could kill you and take it. Just that simple. Remind this cop to whom he speaks, amigo. I never have liked him. He's off. And you take it easy. You know what I'd do to anybody who ever touched my little brother? If you want him to stay on touch, tell him to keep his mouth shut. <laughs> well, you sure ain't changed none, have you, Emiliano? I thought Colonel Green would have beaten the backbone right out of you by now. <laughs> Takes a great deal to change a man, senor. I am thirsty. My horses are thirsty. My friend is thirsty. Bring me some water. Well, you ain't gonna do just as I tell you. Sam Wolf never let a friend of his go thirsty in the desert. Only there's just one thing, Mr. Cartwright. This here camp's gone out of the way, you know. Mighty expensive bringing in supplies. Goodness, they've been too good lately. Yeah. How much you want? All you got. Yeah, now this is mighty nice. Must be several hundred dollars in here. Only ain't enough. Well, that's all we've got. Not all, friend. You've got something there that's better than money. I'll take that there white horse and... You can have all the water you can drink. Nobody touches that horse. <laughs> I'm sorry, you ain't got no choice. I got him, Sam! I got him! Get off my horse, kid. 
I seen him first. I said, get away. He's my horse, and don't you forget it. Oh, hold that. Oh. Hold that. Hold that, boy. Another one across the street, but he's asleep. I have observed him. How tough it be to get the one outside the door? Well, it would be difficult. But our friends were very careless. <laughs> and I'm kind of glad you're on my side, Emiliano. No, it is I, you unfortunate Emiliano. Someone comes. Get back to bed. Does a wolf fear the rabbit so? <laughs> Emiliano, you're the only rabbit that I ever saw that could bite. <laughs> I accept a compliment, amigo. I meant it as one. As your friend. You will leave. Not for long. Tomorrow we'll have a turkey shoot and he'll be our turkey. We will make excellent targets, amigo. I didn't mean you, Emiliano. I'm giving you a chance to live. You're a good man. I always liked you. I want you to come back and join up with us, Emiliano. I'll split with you, same as before. What of this one? <laughs> I'll give you the first shot. If you're a friend of his, be over with quick. And the white horse? Uh-uh. That one's mine. This horse means much to me, amigo. Much as your life. Perhaps. I'll give you until noon to think it over, Miliano. Adios. Nice fellow. Hmm. Turkey shoot, huh? This is his favorite sport. They let a turkey run across the desert and shoot at him with rifles. Has a turkey ever get away? Hmm. It has never been known to happen, amigo. I'll give you a run for your money. Me, muchacho. You got the first shot. <laughs> I did not say I would take it. Look, he offered you your life. What is that? Life without honor? You know, my father used to read me a, a passage from the Bible. It's something like, it's better to be a living dog than a dead lion. You gotta think about it. Look at me, amigo. Look at me. Outside in the corral is a great horse. Tell me, have you ever seen such a horse? No, I haven't, but... And this horse... This horse speaks to me, sings to me. You understand? Yeah, I understand. Now, do you, do you think I will let a, a pig like this, a beast, like this wolf, have this horse? No, I would rather die first. Look at me, amigo. I have always wanted a son my own, all my life. I am too ugly to even have a wife. Yeah. To think my horse will be a gift from a boy to his father. This moves me, amigo. Fear nothing, amigo. I feel for you like I would my own son. Let's see about getting out of here, then. Compañero. Huh? What do you want, eater of toads? Some of that which you drink, for a favor. Ugly one. 
Who are you to ask a favor of me? Uh, I have money here in my hand. Let me see your money. Your first your bottle. Come on, give me the bottle. Huh? <laughs> no. I know. I know, old brother of toads. You want to escape. You want to? Go ahead. Try it. <laughs> I'll kill you. <laughs> Get him out of sight. Right. Any trouble? No difficulty. The former owner will not be needing this. Yeah, where are the horses? This way. Pretty good, senor, eh? Yeah, well, I learned from an expert. I gotta find that horse. I'm not gonna leave here without him. I'm glad to hear you say that. Neither am I. If we split up, we'll meet back here later. All right. Any trouble now, amigo. Creo que le pegué al caballo. Sí, así parece. You take the big white one. Right. Get my horse, Cayetano. See, si, Heffy. Take him in the house. Every man rides.
How many you count? This and this. Yeah, I count the same. The horses are tired. I think we should fire some shots, have them scatter. Then we ride on. Right. What are you making that? Ah, it's an old trick. They have speed up. It's a way around this mesa. If four of them ride fast, they can be waiting for us when we come out of the canyon. We just can't sit here and wait for Wolf and the others to catch up to us. You got a plan? Yeah, suppose we ride down through the canyon. Go as fast as we can to the other end and wait for them. The big white one, he can make it that fast. My horse, too slow, too tired. All right, you follow me. Get there as quick as you can. What are the others behind you? I guess he'll be along. <laughs> That's what I like about you, amigo. You do not worry about tomorrow until tomorrow gets here. <laughs> Just hope it gets here. Pull him back with a couple of shots. Good general, amigo. They come to surprise you and you surprise them, huh? Eh? There's still three of them out. That evens the odds a little, eh? Thanks. Por nada. His name was Rafael, eh? Always plan to kill him someday anyway. Well, that leaves one more. Must be Cayetano. He was always a good friend to me. I will hate to have to kill him. Sometimes I just can't figure you out, Emiliano. Why? I'm a simple man. I have my loves, my hates. Mostly I look out for my own hide. They will be coming from our back soon. Yoni, we're not going to be here. Let's go. No, show. Uh, that Cayetano is the best shot of them all. Easy, easy. Rest, amigo. Rest. We'll be riding out soon. You know, when we get back home, first call from that big white one's gonna be yours. Oh, no, amigo, that, that, that is too much. No, I insist. You cannot do that. This horse belongs to your father. He will not like it. No, he's not gonna mind. That's a promise. You're gonna get the first call. Your father must be a very rare man, amigo. Yeah, I think so. I think you'll think so, too. When one is young, there is always hope, amigo. When one gets older and tired, he does what he must do. Come on, let's get out of here. I'm sorry. You're a good man, amigo. I wish things could have been different. What's this all about? Get on the big white one, amigo, and ride. There's a chance. I'd rather let you have him than give him to some wolf. What's the matter with you? You think I'd ride off and leave you? You have no choice. Some wolf did not offer you a job. A job? We killed his brother. You know you haven't got a chance back there. Yes, I do. 
I will become a bandido again. It is a good life, amigo. You take care of this horse, amigo, or I will come for you myself. The Ponderosa is not that far away. Emiliano... Go on, him! Or I'll kill you now! It'll make me stand big in the eyes of Sam Wolf. You take your choice, amigo. Don't worry. I'll take care of him. Right! Adios, white one. That's the most powerful horse I ever saw. Take at least three horses to run him down. You two got the fastest horses. Get off and give me the reins. Leave the canteens on. Might take me two or three days to run him down. Come on. son. You are the father and the brother. I should have known you are a close family. You saw my son? See, see, he, he ride to the desert. They chase him. If you hurry... What, what are you trying to say? There was no other way. My horse was tired. But along... And the big white one, there was a chance. You did this for little Joe? See, see, and the big white one. He is a fine horse, amigo. <laughs> Your son, he tell me of the Ponderosa. The big horse, he will be happy there. Tell you, tell you, You'll never make it. They got us pinned down tight. It's about half tired of this. Yeah, it's not getting us any closer to little Joe either. Yeah. Listen, Adam. Why don't you cover me and I'll cover you? Now you're back. too big a target.
over there behind that rock. All right, I drive him out and you nail him, okay? Right. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Okay.
Howdy, friend. I, uh... I just finished me off a horse thief. Caught him stealing my horses last night. You're a liar. Now, looky, friend. That kind of talk's gonna get you into a lot of trouble. Like I said, he's a horse thief. He's my son. That's enough for now. Joke. Boy, I, tr I try to get through. Never mind that now, son. I, I have to talk. There was a vaquero with me, Emiliano. I know. I, I talked with him. Well, then he's alive, then. No, I... He wanted you and the horse to get through. Emiliano. He was a good friend, Pa. I, he really loved that horse. Was such a beautiful horse, Pa. Ran his heart out for me. I know, son. So we, we wanted to, we wanted to give me that horse. I tried not to lose him. So we want to give him to you as a gift. I have my gift, son. Let's get him home. on a horse. Being my brother, he can leave on a horse and come home on a boat. Yeah, it's him, all right. He's got company with him. Lady company. Well, someone we know. Uh, there's a, a fellow with him and a... And uh, what? Joe, Joe! Paul, come on, let me in! Yeah, yeah, hey! yeah! It's me! Hey, meet some friends of mine. This is Daniel Pettibone and his wife, Robin. Oh, I, 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 I don't believe I've heard the horse mention the name Daniel Pettibone before. I, I just met him today myself, Paul. They found him standing up by Jackson Ridge. Oh, well, Jackson's Ridge is a far place from anywhere. <clears throat> yeah, well, we were, we were trying to reach Virginia City. And, uh, and we got up there and there was no road or anything, so... Uh... Oh, well, you, you must be very tired of, of the police. Come, come, come. Yeah, wait a minute, Paul. Before you do anything else, something I want to show you. Come here, Daniel. Show him. Come on.
Dad, here's an inventor, Paul. Wait till you see this. It'll just about pop your head off. I got a water quick. to go. My husband doesn't mean to be rude. He has trouble talking to strangers, especially about his work. He's been laughed at so much. Yeah? You didn't have no trouble talking to me. He liked to talk my arm off. Well, you're the exception. You're very likable and very easy to know. I'll try to answer your question. The thing that makes it go is an internal combustion engine. And, and he invented that, huh? Not exactly. The principle of an internal combustion engine has been known a long time. A man named Samuel Brown sold and built a, a kind of one in England 30 years ago. Hmm. Oh, like, like this? Nothing like this. My husband's invented many improvements. Things far advanced, even for modern times. This fuel, for example. It's a distillation of Scottish shell. <clears throat> An electric spark ignites this, uh, this fuel. And much, much else besides. You understand it? No, no. Paul, oh, you don't have to understand it to see it's the biggest thing that ever happened. Well, it's kind of little to me. Oh, Joe, it's a model. From that, you, you make a big one. And how big? Oh, you know, about big enough to sit in. What, to sit in? Sure, and that burns. You got to sit in it before you can ride in it. What do you mean, riding it? Yeah, burn it, Joe. That's what it's all about. This, this thing's a self-powered wagon. You, you sit in it and you ride in it. You don't even have to have horses for it. Look, I'll explain it all to you later. Old Daniel ain't been feeling too good. Well, I'm, I'm gonna put him and his wife up in that spare bedroom. Come on, Robin, you and Daniel. Man's gotta take care of his partners. Us! Sir? Did you say... Partners? Yeah. That's what I said, Paul. Partners. Good night, sir. And thank you. Here we go again. something straight once and for step right up neighbor come on come on what you see before your bulging eyeballs are a collection of mechanical miracles Designed to make a poor man rich and a rich man richer. Now, hold on just one moment, little Joe. Don't forget that you have bought in your time some of these mechanical miracles, too. Oh. But did I ever buy anything like this? That's a perpetual motion machine. How about this? Look at this goodie. That is a magic box. Now, you see... Open it up and you put a little lead inside and a little magic powder. You cook it and silver comes out the bottom. You didn't think this, this gold witcher was such a bad idea when I bought it. Yeah, you can't deny that, little Joe. I can remember your very words. Finding gold with that would be as easy as falling into a well. All right. All right, so I made a mistake once. But did I ever, in my entire life, buy anything... Like this? It was supposed to shoot around corners. It don't work no better than the rest of that junk. I bought it all, I know that. But what's that supposed to prove? Joe, 
Dell and his wife up there. They're, they're honest folk. They ain't crooks. That, that, that power wagon is the real thing. Oh, Hoss, Hoss, I go along with you about those folks upstairs. I, I believe they're honest, too. But... Look, is this thing practical? Practical? Boy, anything you can ride in, practical, ain't it? You build a full-size one and you can go almost any place. Oh, come on. All right, you build a full-size one of those, and I'll find myself any tired... Worn out old nag, and I'll beat you to Virginia City by a day and a half. Maybe you could now, but but well, you you take and you you get some good roads and roads. Can you rope a steer with that thing? No. Can you hit six of these together and then haul freight? No, I reckon you can't. Oh, what are you going to do with it? Oh, dad, gum it! I'm all mixed up. Now, this afternoon, when I sat up there on the tailgate of old Daniel's wagon, it it was as clear to me as the nose on my face. And you can't see it now, hmm? Yeah, Paul, I can see it, but I can't explain it to you. You you want facts and figures and everything proved out ahead of time. You, you just can't always prove things out ahead of time. Sometimes you you got to just have faith, and, and you go ahead and do something, and then when you get it done, you point to it and say, now, there, that, that's what I mean. I can't have faith in a silly-looking thing like that. I, I couldn't either. Well, that's up to you. I'll tell you how much faith I got in it. I'll go to Virginia City with Donald. I'm going to help him get money together. We're going to build a full-size one. You don't have to do a doggone thing. You don't have to put one drop of sweat in it or one thin dime. I'll put $100 in it. I'll put $50 in it. If you ain't got no faith in it. Hoss, we have faith in you. And if you believe so much in this contraption, well... Maybe there is something to it. We'll back you all the way. With money, muscle, or guns? I'm 
I'm fine. You think you better stop them before somebody gets hurt? Hurt them, too? That little old hides as tough as an alligator. Tonight. They do that every day just to keep limber. Look here, you go over here and sit down and take it easy. You just sit right here. I'll take care of that in there. What about it, Mr. Ogilvy? You want to buy in? No, sir. I'm not putting any of my money in a contraption like that. What do you mean, contraption? What's wrong with it? It's a slick trick. Sucker bait. I don't trust that man. The man over there you don't trust happens to be a very good friend of mine, Mr. Ogilvy. You can't scare me, horse cart, right? We've all known you long enough to know you're honest. How long you known him? Long enough to know he's as honest as I am. And a heap smarter. He can do more thinking by Monday noon than you can in a week. If he's so smart, why can't he do his own talking? Well, I reckon with all them brains, that's about all he can handle. Besides, he's got a big dumb partner to do his talking for him. Well, if this contraption can do all you claim, why'd you come to Virginia City? You could finance it a lot quicker in San Francisco. I'll tell you why he came to Virginia City. The doctors made him leave San Francisco, that's why. He ain't well. He's got pains here in his chest, and it hurts him worse when somebody's crowding him. Anything else? Just one thing. There's a man who's been selling the good folks of Virginia City merchandise of all kinds for over 15 years. I say any man who invests good money in this infernal machine's a fool. Then, sir, you must name me a fool. For herewith, I pledge $1,000 to the Pettibone Power Wagon Company. I'll be sold in half with the blackberry vine. Well... Mr. Rich. I'm uh, Cyrus K. Throckmorton, my dear. And uh, that is my associate, Mr. Peter Long. Howdy, folks. Never heard of you. Which is not surprising. I only arrived in your fair city yesterday. I am a broker and investment counselor known in the financial centers of New York, London, and Paris, here to invest funds for Eastern Capital. And now, sir, if you would introduce me to this genius who invented this mechanical marvel. Yes, sir. This, this here is Daniel Pettibone. Truly a great honor, sir. A man of your capabilities is rare indeed. <laughs> I'd like also to meet your business manager. Uh, well, uh, there ain't nobody but just me and Daniel here. I sort of figured on learning the business end of it as we went along. An understandable error, sir. What a grievous one. The financial world is a teeming jungle to the uninitiated, uh, strewn with many pitfalls. Let me think. There is a slight possibility I may be able to extend a guiding hand. By golly. I would deem it a privilege, indeed an honor, to contribute my time and uh, not inconsiderable experience in financial matters to this enterprise as a service to the community. And now, let us have a closer look at this machine that Mr. Oglesby calls an <laughs> infernal machine. <laughs> wow! Beautiful little thing, isn't it? Hey! <laughs> like I said, we're buying in. <laughs> like I said, we're buying in. Hey, <laughs> you old girl. <laughs> we have here. Oh, that's nice. Ah, blue and gold. That should appeal to the natives. I never seen nothing so pretty in all my days. She likes something out in a dream. Yes, yes, my boy. Beautiful indeed. And I have one for almost any endeavor you care to name. Uh, forest lands, gold mine, dance halls. I'll bet she ain't no dance hall because she wants to be. Lady like that, she ain't always got her choice. Yes, I think this will do nicely. Thing of rare beauty. We should have no difficulty in selling several thousand of these to the good people of Virginia City. You ain't gonna sell big red none them. To everyone an equal opportunity, my boy. However, the first order of business is to have some of these printed up. 
I should say, um, 2,000 to begin with. Who's there? It's me, Big Red. Oh, uh, just a moment, my dear. Mr. Throckmorton? You said you wanted to talk to me. Come in, my dear. Come right in. Everybody's so happy you're going to handle the business end of the Pettibone Power Wagon Company. Really? I wouldn't have missed it for the world. <laughs> Miss Red, I... Oh. You run along now, Mr. Long, and take care of the printing. Have it printed up just like that. Run along, my boy. Now, my dear, how would you like to enter into an association with uh, Mr. Long and myself, say, as... Uh, well, private secretary, perhaps. Gee, it's what I'd like to do more than anything else. Yes, yes. My dear, this is going to be the biggest thing that ever happened to Virginia City. Now, run along and we'll discuss salary at our earliest opportunity. <laughs> out, out, out! You hear? The printer! Now, my dear, I believe it's safe for you to leave. Thank you. anything except a lot of fire and smoke. Hey, that's Hoss Cartwright over in the back. See him? Oh, yeah, I do now. And there's Jeff and Jigger by the fire. Kids must know Hoss pretty well if you can recognize him like that. What are they doing in there, Mr. Pettibone? Well, Sonny, they're trying to make a casting. It's the ninth time we've tried. Well, how do you make a casting? Well, <clears throat> you take some iron, see, and you melt it and you pour it into a mold. Now, that mold is a shape of something you want to make. Now, when that iron cools off, it hardens. You take away your mold, and what you got left there is the casting. What do they do with it? You make an engine if it comes out right. Boy, I bet your horse can make it come out right. I've seen him pick up a whole horse. <laughs> this is more like picking up an elephant. But what if he can't do it? Well, if he can't do it, we just can't build the power wagon. Don't you worry about it. That horse is pretty stubborn. Stubborn and capable. <laughs> Darling, look what I have. Mr. Throckmorton had the made up. Isn't it, darling? He's going to give one to everyone who buys stock in the company. You boys like one of these? Well, sure, sure would. What are. is it? It's a crank. Use the crank the Pettibone Power Wagon. You take this part of it, and you put it in the front part of the engine, and you crank it, you turn it, and pretty soon the engine starts... How do you feel, darling? Oh, I feel great, just great. Come on, come on. Don't overdo. Not now. Not when everything is going so wonderful. Sure don't want to lose us. Set him down easy now. Here, uh, Jigger, you get over here, Jeff. Okay. 
Seems to have settled a little better this time, huh? Yeah, at least it didn't rile up. If that means anything. Uh, we were whooped if it don't work this time. We've tried just about everything. Come on, let's get that other. You just don't know what all this means to me. Working for Mr. Throckmorton and Mr. Long. Golly, and all these new ideas he has. Yes, he does think pretty, pretty fast. Oh, don't worry, Reg, you'll do fine. Well, I don't know. Well, you know. I never worked anywhere outside a saloon. I mean, all of a sudden, being a lady. Being a lady is a state of mind. And I think you were always a lady. I'm so happy. I think I'm going to cry. Oh, come on now. Don't do that. This is no time for tears. Miss Pettibone, I'm just busting. I gotta tell somebody. Tell what? Well, Pete and I, I mean, uh, Pete and me is... Really? You and Mr. Long? Oh, I think that's just wonderful. Aren't you just pleased to pieces? Well, I'm more scared than anything. Whatever for? Well, I don't know about getting married. Gee, for the rest of my life and everything. If my marriage should end tomorrow, I'd still call it the most precious thing in all my life. Here, it's my wedding veil. I've always kept it with me. I want you to wear it at your wedding. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I give you the marvelous Pettibone Power Wagon. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, I see doubt in some of your faces. I even see rejection in some. But stay. Let me breathe a breath of life into this vision. Listen to me. Look around you. What do you see? Some will say only shacks. I say open your eyes. I see tall chimneys and enormous buildings with huge furnaces that spout streams of molten metal where strong men pour and cast. And there. There, at the end of the street, I see a many-windowed factory where lathes hum and drills spin, where careful craftsmen fashion gleaming parts out of raw steel. And there, massive and dramatic, there stands the assembly plant. An endless belt moves there, past each man, where in his turn he adds a wheel, a seat, a mud guy until finally the Pettibone Power Wagon rolls from that line, a finished product, shining and powerful. Some of you may ask, what do we need with a power wagon? And some may say, no machine will ever take the place of man's most loyal friend, the horse. But I predict that this machine will travel in excess of 50 miles. Not in a day, my friends. No, not in half a day, but in the short space of one single hour. <laughs> you, you, and you, all of you, will have the chance to share in this glorious future. That you may certainly prosper. That you possibly may even grow rich. That is not important. Far more important that you can say to your children's children, I was there. I stepped forward. I said, I demand my right to share. I thank you. Mr. 
Starks real good. That'll sell a million. Mighty nice of you to say so. Listen, I better get out here and get me some of them Starks before they're all gone. Anytime Horace Ogilvy puts a nickel into anything, you bet he's figuring on getting a dollar back. Sure do look pretty today. How do you feel, pretty? Dressed up like this, working for Mr. Throckmorton. And guess what, Haas? What? You tell him, darling. Oh, well, well, well we're... Uh, neither one of you have to say nothing to me to figure out what you're up to. I'll bet you dollars to donuts you're figuring on getting hitched, ain't you? And I'll tell you what I'm going to do for a wedding present. I'm going to give you the first genuine Pettibone power wax. This is the birdie now, up here. Watch up here. Still. Very quiet. Dad, burn it. Right where they could be. They're near a half hour late already. It takes a while for the bride to get dressed, Hoss. Hoss, why don't you sit down here? Let me get a picture of you in the Pettibone power wagon so I can oh. have it. Take your own. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this all right for you, sir? That's wonderful. You better put a bigger plate in that camera if you expect to get it. <laughs> Look at the birdie. Well, he ain't here either, is he? Who, Pete? I thought he was with you. Well, he ain't. He's gone. What do you mean, gone? I mean, gone. That's what I mean. He was supposed to come get me, but I got tired waiting, so I went up to his room. And you know what I found? My Pete and that Throckmorton had packed up and pulled out, and they took all that money with them. Come on, Red. Howdy, Miss Pettibone. I'm sorry to bother, but I need to talk to Daniel. Is he pert enough to talk? Of course. Come in, Hoss. Hi, Daniel. <clears throat> Hi, Hoss. Robin here is the original model of the fuss budget. <laughs> Any news of Mr. Throckmorton? Daniel ain't no use in us fooling ourselves. That old scoundrel and Pete, too, they... They took that money. They had no intentions of bringing it back. Is the sheriff trying to find him? Oh, yeah, yeah. Sheriff and everybody else in town. They got a posse that's been all over the country. Daniel, you, uh. You ever been in jail? No, I ain't never been in jail. Well, it ain't really so bad when you got good grub. Sheriff Coffee's got the best grub in town. Am I going to jail? But why? Horace Ogilvy's got half the town stirred up over that, that money it's gone. Roy Coffey thought it might be a good idea if... Daniel came down and set a spell in the jailhouse. Just as a guest, you understand, not, not as a prisoner. You can lock the door from the inside and keep the key yourself. <clears throat> I'm ready. Let's, uh... Let's go. I'll be back. Casting came out and busted. Wouldn't you know it this time? It's as solid as a dollar. That means we could have finished building this whole rig. Daniel said there weren't nothing tougher than making that there casting. Well, you ought to go out and try to raise some more money. That would be tougher. Yeah, I guess you're right. 
handled in jail and no money. Boss, you figure you can finish building this here contraption? Oh, uh, no, Jigger. I didn't even know what we was doing when Dunn was here telling us how. Maybe we ought to get drunk. Drunk? Drunk? I'd get up a lynch party and hang horse Oglesby higher than a hawk's nest. Oglesby got no call to work up everybody again, Dan. Dan never took his money. Yeah, hit old Oglesby in the pocketbook and it sure enough hurts him. Yeah. Dave! Yeah. Big Red. I'm your friend, Big Red. You ain't got no call to point that gun at me. I ain't pointing it at you. I just want you to come with me. Where to? To Burton Falls. And when we get there, I'm going to shoot a hole right through Mr. Pete Long. Pete? Is that where Pete's at? Right near there. I got this letter from him. Him and Throckmorton are hiding out close to Burton Falls, just waiting for the law to quit looking for him. He wants me to sneak out of town and meet him up there. Me! He thinks I'm a crook, too. Why, that dirty skunk. I may be a floozy, but I'm an honest floozy. You're doggone right you are. They're staying at the old Perkins place. Dab, burn it, no wonder we missed them. Who'd have figured they'd have gone to ground so close by? We kept riding right on by him. Old Throckmorton was smart as a fox. Yeah, but his partner ain't. Old Pete couldn't think a lick to begin with. And then after he fell in love with Big Red here, he just went plumb simple. No offense, Big Red. Don't make no difference. I'm going to shoot a hole right through him anyway. Now, now Big Red, I, I don't know nothing about that, but if you can ride a horse, you're welcome to come along with me. But this gun's got to stay. Let's go. Come on. I don't blame you for covering up this dead blame casting jigger. It ain't no good to us now. I ain't covering that. I'm uncovering this. Hey, I put that in there for an emergency. When that big redhead come in here with that there shotgun, that makes this an emergency. <laughs> Even swindler, we'll pinch you if we have to wait a year. Here's something else for you. Something the stockholders wanted us to give back to you. Eat your heart away for one. There ain't but one like Big Red. I sure wish she'd show up. Any reason to suppose she might show up? No, no. None I could think of. She, she might get lucky or something and run into us. Marvelous. Good beans, enough bread to last us for several weeks, a modest share of $25,000. Your cup should be full to overflowing, my boy. I'd rather have big bread. You hear horses? No, just wedding bells. All right, boys, just hold it right where you are. Well, Hoss, Red, what an unexpected pleasure. You are just in time for an evening repast. Oh, honey, I was afraid you didn't get my letter. Letter? What letter? Why, 
Why, you ungrateful snake in the grass. Don't look to me for no sympathy, you dirty black skunk! You two ain't just about the worst reprobates I ever seen. We're living out here in this comfortable cabin and cooking beans and underwear. Oh, poor little Dan Pettibone sits in that jailhouse. Dan's in jail? What'd he steal? Nothing. He got blamed for what you stole. You still got that money, ain't you? Well, that money is a sacred trust. We're guarding it with our lives. Why, every penny of it is right there under the bed. In that valise. Charge! To the barricades! Attack! Hit him with something! <laughs> It's about over. Shoot me. Ain't that, ain't that gun loaded? Won't it shoot? It'll shoot. It's a weakness I had since I was a boy. I never could shoot a friend. What I can't figure out is if why you wanted to take that money in the first place. If you wanted to get rich, you could have you could have stayed with a pettibone power wagon company and got ten times richer, just like you said. Why did you have to steal? Because I'm dishonest. All right, you two stand right there by the bar. Stay put. Here it is, boys. Every penny of it. There's Mr. Throckmorton to tell you how sorry him and Pete are for trying to run off with it. Well, yeah. What's the matter with everybody? I brought your money back to you. I reckon it's my place to tell you, Hoss. I fixed up a mess of tar and feathers and threatened Dan Pettibone with them. 
Doc says his heart failed him. He passed away. He died? Is Mrs. said it could have happened any time, Hoss. Take it kindly if you'd give the widow Pettibone the money I invested. That's, that's a lot of money, Mr. Oakley. Not enough. Not nearly enough. Well, come on, Jeff. Let's get back to the mine. Jiggering. Ain't you fellas gonna take yours? Ah, we don't want it. Don't need it. Come on. Yeah. We'd spend it on booze anyway. And I tried to steal from them. You know, my boy, I'm an unmitigated scoundrel. I shall ask the judge for 20 years. You know, Hoss, Pete here never wanted to steal that money. All he ever wanted to do was to marry Big Red there. It's all he still wants to do. Marriage? Did anybody say marriage? I did. Hansi Bunsi. Sweetie pie. <laughs> you know, I wonder if the sheriff could put Pete's bill on my tab. Mr. Throckmorton, I'll do everything in my power to see that you get your wish. Ain't much of that, that uh, Scotty Shield, ain't, ain't much of it left. Couple of drops. Mm. Yeah. Can't get over it. Huh? Pretty old big red looking there. Brand new wedding dress. Yeah. Old Pete was as spruce as a brand new tattoo. You know, I can't get over those people letting Trunk Morton and Pete go scot free after them stealing that money. Well, Paul, they didn't really steal it. They they were in charge of the money and they everybody figures they just took a ride with it and then brought it back. Yeah. Oh, that didn't didn't Dan have any plans for this thing? Yeah. His missus took him back east with her. Said that folks just wasn't ready for it yet. He's gonna save them for their boy. I didn't know they had a boy. They ain't now. But come the middle of June. <laughs> say it would have worked. Joe? 
Well, by golly, it's good to see you. I figured you might feel like that. Yeah. <laughs> nice to see you, too, Ben. Well, come on in. Not many days happen like this, Ben. I figure man ought to enjoy them while he can. Yeah. <laughs> like it says in the good book, it ain't what a man's got, it's his begats that counts. Well, uh, Jake, I uh, agree with you there. I guess we're lucky to have our children. You're right. Come into this world with nothing, we go out with nothing. Yeah. What reason for a man's existence if it ain't to look out for his kids? Very little, I guess. Well, I've been blessed that way. Two strapping boys and a girl. Of course, the boys have given me some trouble. <laughs> but not my Mary. She's as good as they come. I agree with you, Jake. She's a mighty fine girl. Sometimes I used to think that the only thing I could raise on my land was a ruckus. Two years without rain or grass. And when the grass came, fire and rustlers and... Well, you've had your share of hard luck, Jake. There's no denying. The Lord's will. Keep working hard and sweating. And things get better. I'm going to send uh, 600 head of cattle to market this year. 600 head? Well, mm -hmm. by golly, Jake, that's wonderful. Ben, I want to do my share for the young'uns. Well, every father should. You got good land to spare, I got cattle. And together we can scrape them up a nice little spread. Start them in right. <laughs> My Mary and your little Joe. Been hoping that it happened. I'm purely happy it did. Jake, I... I don't rightly know what you're aiming at. Well, now, a, a church wedding would have been more to my taste and a barbecue and a dance after, and... But... I finally tracked that sorrow down, Father. How you doing, Mr. Parsons? Well, little Joe, how's Mary? Mary? Uh, yes. Joe, I, uh... <sighs> Sit down. It was bad enough for Mary to lope, but the least you could do would be to... Bring her back afterwards so we could help celebrate. Hey, Mary eloped, huh? Who with? Oh, now, little Joe, I know about you young'uns. I couldn't be happier. Jake, Jake believes that... that you uh, eloped with his daughter Mary. Me? Oh, heck no, sir. I, I didn't elope with anybody. Now, well, little Joe, there's no, no need to lie about it. Well, I'm not lying. I haven't even seen her. Mary told me and the boys that... You're going to take her on a picnic yesterday. Me? Yes, you. She drove out in the buggy to meet you a little afternoon. And she ain't been back since. Now, if you didn't elope, suppose you tell me where she was all last night and where she is now. Well, I don't know. I told you I haven't seen her. Where was he last night? My son is old enough to answer for himself. You know where I was. I was out looking for that sorrel. Got late, so I camped in Buckhorn Flats. That's your answer, Jake. Where is she? Now look, all I can tell you is the truth. I didn't see her. If she went on a picnic with someone, it wasn't me. Jake. She said she was going with you. Well, you must have heard her wrong. She says you've been courting her for two months. You deny that? I have to because it isn't true. You calling my Mary a liar? No, sir. I'm saying there must be some mistake. Appears to me there is some kind of mistake. Some bad mistake. Appears to me, too, there's going to be a wedding when my Mary comes home and tells me the truth about now, all Jake, this. Jake, I know you're upset, but my son doesn't lie. Neither does my Mary. <laughs> Parsons may not be as rich as Cartwright's. But we do know the difference between right and wrong. We 
found Mary, Pa. She's dead. The buggy was near Indian Leap. The body was at the bottom of the cliff. Jake, this... This is terrible. Is there anything we could do? It? You Cartwrights have done enough. I want to see my daughter. You boys take me to her. We'll be back. Engaged, aren't we? I want the whole world to see and know how lucky I am. Dolly, do you think the governor will be at the reception? I don't know. That's the tenth time you've asked me that. Does it really matter that much? Well, of course it does. I want to meet him. Contacts like that are very important in the legal profession. Jerome, can't you ever forget business? Sweetheart, I didn't have the start that your father did. If I want to be worthy of you, I've got to make every moment count. Mr. Cartwright, I didn't know you were coming in this afternoon. Well, we hadn't intended to, uh, Mr. Bell. Hello, Betty May. Is Hiram in, please? Yes, sir, I'll tell him you're here. Thank you. Mr. Cartwright to see you, sir. Ben? Little Joe! Well, this is a pleasant surprise. What brings you into Virginia City? Ben? Well, Hiram, uh, trouble. <laughs> we need your help. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that, Ben. And well, that's what I'm here for. Come in, come in. Hiram, uh, this isn't an ordinary legal matter. You make it sound pretty serious, Ben. Well, it is. It's quite personal. I'll be outside if you want me, Mr. Wood. What do you think the trouble is, Jerome? I've never seen Ben Cartwright so upset. People are always upset when they come to a lawyer's office. That's why attorneys like your father get such large fees. Jerome, that's a fine way to talk about your future father-in-law. If you worked as hard as he well, does... darling, I would. But every hour I work is an hour away from you. We'll try working for an hour anyway. I'll be back at two. We can leave for the reception from here. I'll be waiting for you. Ben, I can understand your concern about this, but I don't see what you got to worry about. If little Joe is chasing a horse and buck on flat all day, there's no way he can be implicated in the death of this girl. Well, maybe not legally, but Jake Parson and his boys think he is implicated. Well, ben, it was a terrible tragedy. They were overwrought. Well, I can understand that, but I don't want my son gunned down by someone taking the law into his own hands. Hey, don't you worry about the Parson boys, Pa. I can take care of them. You'll do no such thing. You'll go to the sheriff and give him a full account of your whereabouts these last few days. And, Ben, you tell him what transpired between Jake Parson and yourself. That way, any protecting that needs to be done will come from the law. Mm. Well, all right, Hiram. Came to you for advice, if that's what you think we should do. That's what you should do. Well, Roy Coffey will know how to handle it. Yeah. Uh, Sheriff Coffey's not in town. He's in Carson City on that wrestling case. Oh, yeah. Uh, new deputy, Rick Conley, I think, is in charge. You think that'll make any difference, Hiram? Well, I haven't had a chance to get acquainted with Deputy Conley. But just to make sure, I'll send Jerome along with you to see that your statements are taken down properly. Thank you. Jerome, would you step in, please? Yes, sir. Jerome, I want you to go to the sheriff's office with Ben and little Joe. They're going to make a statement. And I want you to protect their interest and see that it's recorded correctly. You want that taken care of immediately, sir? You know, Betty May and I do it at the reception. Well, that'll have to wait. Of course. Is this Ponderosa business? Well, not exactly. Little Joe's going to make a statement as to his whereabouts at the time of Mary Parson's death. Mary Parson? I hadn't heard. Her body was found at the bottom of Indian Leap. <laughs> Three weeks prior to the company and a uh, person in the company of others. 
Well, this seems to be perfectly all right. All right, you both sign it. I'll just witness it. That should take care of things. Unless there's an inquest. Inquest? Well, I see no reason for an inquest. It's obviously a case of accidental death. Well, maybe it was and maybe it wasn't. That's not for me to decide. That's up to the coroner. Well, I, I feel that an inquest would be completely out of order in a case like this. Well, mister, I don't care what you feel. I'm running this office until Sheriff Coffey gets back. And I'm not about to decide anything until Doc Martin tells me whether it looks to him like this girl was... Hit, choked, shot, or whatever before she took that fall. Well, we can understand your position, Rick, and we'll go along with anything that's necessary. Do you, uh, you want us to stay in town? Might be a good idea, Mr. Cartwright. Jake and his boys brought the girl's body in. Doc Martin's making the examination right now. You gentlemen will excuse me. I'm late for an appointment. However, I must advise you that even if there is an inquest, there's no need for you to stay in town. There was no witness to involve little Joe. I'll be able to handle everything at the proper time. Thank you, Mr. Bell. Bye, sir. He's right, Mr. Cartwright. I can't keep you in town unless you want to stay. Well, we'll, uh... We'll stay in town until after the doctor has made his examination. We'll be in his office if you need us. All right, sir. What's the doctor going to be able to tell us? I don't know. The more information we have, the better we'll be able to reason with Jake Parson. Yeah. Well, that girl fell to on her feet. I don't see how they could tell anything. Doctor, were you able to reach any conclusion? There's one conclusion that was easy to reach. What was that? Every bone in her body was broken. Was there anything to indicate that, well, it was anything but an accident? Not specifically. Well, then it was an accident, then. It could have been. Or it could have been suicide. Suicide? What makes you say that? She wasn't married, was she? Well, you know, she wasn't. She should have been. <laughs> I was never even alone with her. I'm gonna have to tell this Deputy Connolly right away. I guess you know that, Ben. Yeah, I know that. I, I was just thinking about what Jake Parsons gonna do when he finds out the truth. Well, thank you, Doctor. Why don't you have better go home? Joe went by me like I was a rock in the road. Oh, it's nothing personal, I'm sure. They're concerned about Mary Parson being found dead. Mary Parson dead? When was this? Our brothers found her body yesterday. Happened the day before, though. The day before? I saw her that day around noon. Where'd you see her? Why, right on the road to Indian Leap. Must have happened right after I saw them. Them? You mean there was somebody with her? Sure there was. She was with little Joe Cartwright. I even waved to them when they went by. Are you sure you saw her with little Joe Cartwright? Don't you think I know little Joe when I see him? Well, you had better be sure, because you're going to have to tell that to Ben Cartwright. Tell Ben Cartwright? Why? Because as soon as you've signed a statement of that effect and everything's legal, you're going with me out to the Ponderosa to arrest little Joe for murder. 
Doc, you better witness this. All right. Mr. Hardner? Howdy. Rick, Mr. Hardner. Howdy, Hoss. Howdy, Hoss. You power home? Yeah, he's inside. Come on in. Come on in, man. John. Hey, Betty. Well, come on in, gentlemen. Sit down. Uh, thank you, Mr. Cartwright, but uh, we're here on official business. Oh, well, what does that mean? You go ahead and tell them what you told me, Mr. Hardner. Sorry as I am to say it, Ben. I saw little Joe and Mary Parson driving up toward Indian Leap day before yesterday. You what? You were in Parson's buggy, little Joe. Your paint horse was tied on behind. Mr. Hardner, that's not the truth. I wish it had been somebody else that saw you, Joe. It ain't easy to do this to a friend. Pa, he's lying. Paul, oh, little Joe wasn't in that buggy. He wasn't nowhere near Indian Leap. No, I know that. Well, what are we doing standing here listening this far? Well, John, for some reason, thinks that he saw little Joe and Mary in that buggy. He believes it. Well, that kind of believing can put a rope around Joe's neck. <laughs> You still say that you weren't there. Of course, I say it. I wasn't within 20 miles of that place. All right. Comes down to your word against Mr. Hardner's. In a case like that, a jury's going to have to decide it. I'm sorry, Joe, but I'm going to have to take you in. Get your horses ready. We're going to town. Doubt that for an instant. I'll take that, Joe. Stop right there, all of you. You don't have to do this. Little Joe's under arrest. We're on our way to town. Get out of the way, Cartwright. I come out here to get one, but I'll take two if I have to. Little Joe's not wearing a gun. You can't shoot an unarmed man. What chance did he give my sister? I never even saw your sister. And that's what you'd say, sure. But she said she was going to beat you, and that's good enough for me. Get out of the way, Cartwright! Now, don't be a fool, Pete. Let the law handle this. Now, Cartwright's a big name around these parts. One kind of law for you and another kind for the rest of us. Now, that isn't true, Pete. Not this time it ain't. I'm going to have me an eye for an eye. You ain't out of the woods yet, Cartwright. Big of my pa and brother here about this. Joe? Well, I'll say it again. I wasn't within 20 miles of Indian Leap. Then you got nothing to be afraid of. Yeah, haven't I? All I saw was a rabbit, a buck, and that sorrel. Are they going to testify on my behalf? Well, I guess somebody better tell Jake Parson about Pete. Don't worry. I don't doubt that all the Parsons have heard about it by now. Yeah, I guess you're right. I'm going to see Hiram Wood. You boys coming along? No, we'll keep Joe company. Yeah, make sure you don't get no uninvited company. Well, that's a good idea.
I didn't want to hurt Pete, but I, I just couldn't let him kill somebody in cold blood. Could I? I had to shoot. Of course you did, Ben. Of course you did. But right now, the Parsons are the least of your worries. Well, let's face it. This has turned out to be a lot more serious than I'd anticipated. With a witness like John Hardner... Did John have any reason to lie, Ben? Oh, no, not John Hardner. What? Ben, this is a difficult question for me to ask you. Are you sure that little Joe is telling the whole truth? You ask me to doubt my son. No, 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 I'm not asking that. All I'm asking is, do you think there's any chance that little Joe... If I were to start doubting my son at this point, everything I've lived and worked for would be lost. Ben, I'm your lawyer. I have to think the way a jury's going to think. Believe me, with this latest news about the girl and John Hardner's testimony, this is going to come before a jury. Hiram, what do we do? Well, you two have a good time at the reception? Oh, Father, it was absolutely wonderful. Jerome made such an impression on the governor, the governor hardly noticed anyone else. I was surprised how young he is. We did seem to have a lot in common. He even wanted to know my views on politics. Uh, that's fine, Jerome, that's fine. Right now, politics can wait. We've got something much more urgent to consider at the moment. Well, yes, sir, of course. As a matter of fact, it's been on my mind all during the reception. I'm glad to hear that. You come up with any ideas? Well, sir, I don't like to say this about the dead, but with that girl's reputation, I don't think there's a jury in Virginia City that would convict little Joe. Jerome, what a dreadful thing to say. Well, I'm sorry, sweetheart, but we're fighting for a man's life. I don't... I don't suppose... Suppose we took Jake Parsons' buggy back up to Indian Leap again and have John Hardner show us exactly what he saw. That might be an excellent idea, Ben. If there's any possibility of showing that John Hardner was mistaken, why, I think... That's just it. But what happens, sir, if it confirms John Hardner's statement? Then we'll have no case at all in court. No, sir, I think we've got to fight this out on the basis of the reputations of that girl and Mr. Cartwright's son. Mr. Bell, we are going on the assumption that little Joe is innocent. Yes, sir, of course. I'm just pointing out that legally we might be taking unwarranted risk. He's got a point there, Ben. There would be some risk involved. It's a risk I'm perfectly willing to take. I hope we don't regret this, Mr. Wood. the man that shot my son. The rifle, Jake. Put it down. You won't need it in here. Where's Ben Cartwright? I'm right here, Jake. Pete took the law into his own hands, tried to shoot an unarmed man. Mr. Cartwright did the only thing he could do in self-defense. It's true, Jake. I saw it. Hardner, seems to me like you jumped the fence. He was going to testify little Joe was with my Mary. Now you're siding with Cartwrights. I'm not siding with anybody. I saw little Joe and Mary up at Indian Leap. I'll say it under oath. I also saw Pete trying to shoot an unarmed man. I'll swear to that, too. I had no choice. I'm sorry it happened, Pete. One of mine dead, one shot. And all I hear anybody say is, I'm sorry. There's one thing we can do, Jake. We can take your buggy up to Indian Leap again in the morning. Why? So John Hardner can show us where he was when the buggy passed him. We can all get a good look at what he saw. Hardner says he's seen little Joe. You want him to change his mind? My son's life is at stake. I'm just trying to get at the truth. All I'm thinking about is my daughter was killed. And your son did it. Well, now, supposing it wasn't little Joe. Suppose it was somebody else. Wouldn't you want to know who it was? All right, boys. We'll give them that chance. But if we find what I think we will, there won't be no need of holding a trial.
All right. Bring on the buggy. Is this as close as you got to that buggy? Just about the exact spot, Ben. Well, we can't see the man's face, and we're afoot. How can you see him sitting as high as you are? I didn't say I could see his face from here. I sure saw his paint horse tied on behind the buggy. And he probably turned and looked when you got down on the road. Uh, stop putting words in his mouth. Move the buggy on down the road. Now you ride down to the road and make your turn. I remember. Now I can tell you how I knew it was little Joe. When the buggy made the curve, the man had his foot on the dash. I could see his leg. What does that prove? When did you see his face? I didn't have to see his face. His leg was enough. He was wearing his gun tied down to his left leg. That's how I knew it was little Joe. Well, what'd you find out? Just what we knew we'd find. Well, Deputy, what do you say now? Inquest will be in my office at 2 o'clock. I'm just saying to it that whatever needs doing is done proper and legal. My sister's dead. The man that pushed her off that cliff is still alive. You call that legal and proper? I said there'd be an inquest and a trial. There'll be a trial and a hanging. We heard what you said, Mr. Hardner. And if you don't say it again so everybody can hear, you won't live to get off that witness chair. Thank you very much, Mr. Will the foreman of the coroner's jury please rise? Have you reached a verdict? Yeah, we sure have. State it. Mary Parson was murdered by little Joe Cartwright. Jim, you know better than to say that. All you're to determine is the cause of death. Anything else will be decided by a judge and jury at the proper time. Well, that is the cause of death. Little Joe Cartwright pushed her off of that cliff. If the jury finds that she died by violence, it'll have to be it. Deputy Connolly. Joseph Cartwright, you are hereby bound over to stand trial for the murder of Mary Parson. <laughs> Pony and being left-handed, you get a fill in so much trouble. Hiram, the boys and I know that Joseph didn't murder Mary Parson. I don't care what anybody says, he didn't do it. Pa, wait a minute. What? What Joe just said about the pony and, the, and being left-handed. No? What about it? Well, now, Hardner didn't say he saw the man's face. He just said he saw a pink pony and a left-handed gun. Yeah, it was enough to hang me. Yeah, but is it? What are you driving at, Adam? Well, why would Mary Parson tell her father that she was going out with little Joe when we know that she wasn't? Yeah. Why would she, Paul? Well, obviously because she didn't want her father to know that she was going out with the whoever it was. Yeah, and, yeah, and whoever it was must have a left-handed gun and a paid pony, right? How about that, Hiram? Fine, but how do we prove it? Well, first let's find this whoever it was. Hoss, you check with the harness makers. Adam, check the livery stables. All right. Hiram, I don't know why we didn't think of this before. Ben, if this works, 
I'll get Jerome Bell working on it right away. What a surprise. I really shouldn't be here, but I wanted to talk to you. And Papa said you'd be here working. Oh, I'm glad you're here. I'm always glad to see you. The shy and proper Betty May. All these books. Do you have to go through them all? I'm planning little Joe's defense. Or trying to. If I had it my way in the first place, we'd be in a lot better shape. Jerome... I'm sure Father knew what he was doing. I hope he lets me take over this case. I feel I can do as well as any man alive in that courtroom. But I have to win your father over first. Sweetheart, you can help me with that. This is such an important case, Jerome. Little Joe's life's at stake. That's what I mean. If I win this case, I'll be the most sought-after lawyer in Virginia City. We can get all the things that we've planned for. Your father will take me on as a full partner and... Well, who knows? The governor was a lawyer. That's the way he started. Of course, Jerome. I'm sure all those things will come in time. But right now, we must be thinking about little Joe. Thinking isn't enough. The evidence clearly indicates his guilt. Well, I don't think he's guilty. But it's what I can convince the jury of that counts. Well, I can't believe he's guilty. Jerome, I don't believe he'd push anyone off a cliff. Given sufficient provocation, any man can commit a murder. That's not my definition, sweetheart, but you'll find it in any legal text just the same. It was such a shuddery feeling sitting in that buggy on Indian Leap. I dreamed about that girl, only she didn't have a face. You know, I always was a little envious of her. She was such a pretty girl. I never paid much attention to her. She was cheap and flashy. Let's not talk about morbid things, darling. Let's, let's talk about us. You will help me with your father. Jerome, must we always talk about my father? Why not? We both want the same things. A big house, beautiful clothes, fine horses. I just want happiness. I just want... No. I have to say this, Jerome. You want success so badly that... sometimes I wonder if you want to marry me just because I'm Hiram Wood's daughter. You silly girl. You know better than that. All I want is you. Cartwright. I'd like a word with you. I said I'd like a word with you. Well, to what do I owe this unexpected pleasure, huh? I thought you and Jerome were going to the governor's ball this evening. We are, Father, a little later. Jerome went to the hotel to change. He's been working so hard. I was... I was lonesome. So I thought I'd wait here. Am I interrupting anything? No, no, just catching up on some odds and ends. Here, here, sit down. I'm sorry I've been neglecting you lately, darling, but I just never seem to get caught up. Now this nasty business with a parson girl has to come up. I know that. It's been a strain on Jerome, too. I wish you both could slow down. <laughs> now you sound just like your mother used to. I can't imagine Mother ever scolding you about anything. She was a wonderful woman. Wonderful woman. I just hope that you and Jerome will have the happiness your mother and I had. Of course you will. 
I hope so, Dad. Well, you don't have to sound so desperate about it. Dad, we don't have to lie to one another. Most girls my age are married five years and have a family. I'm not the prettiest girl in town, and I just don't want to make a mistake. No, 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 no. What's this? Have you and your young man have words or something? I suppose I'm being silly. It's just that sometimes, sometimes it seems as if Jerome loves his work more than he does me. Oh, so that's it. Well, sweetheart, I doubt very much that you're the first woman ever to say that. Jerome's a very ambitious young man. That's it. Ambitious. So terribly ambitious. It frightens me. Dad, at the reception, when Jerome met the governor, it was just as if suddenly I ceased to exist. Baby, baby, now you are being silly. I suppose I am. I shouldn't be bothering you with my troubles. Of course you should. Of course you should. That's what I'm here for. Now, you run along and have a good time. The world looks a lot prettier under a full moon, you know. Thanks for talking to me, Dad. May, what are you doing here? Is anything wrong? No, there's nothing wrong. I just wanted to see you. You shouldn't have come here. Why? I'm in love with you. I was lonesome. Someone might have seen you. You know how the gossips are in this town. Let them talk. I'm not ashamed of my love. Are you? Of course not. I just didn't want you to see how I live. I'll be with you in a moment. But I want to see where you live. I want to know everything about you. I want to know every thought you have. Come on, sweetheart, let's go. Who's the girl in the picture? Oh, just some girl, nothing important. That's a picture of Mary Parson, isn't it? I picked it up today in connection with the trial. You knew her, didn't you? But he may you're being unreasonable. Being a lawyer, I meet many people. If you had told me, I wouldn't have cared. I knew there were other women. Jerome, why did you lie to me? There wasn't anything to tell you. There wasn't anything between us. Then why did you lie? Well, I, I didn't want your father to know. I was afraid he might object. Darling, please, let's forget it. She was very lovely, wasn't she? She was prettier than I am, younger and prettier. That isn't so. You're the prettiest girl I've ever seen. Darling, I love you. Don't you know that? No, I don't know it. I wish I did, but it isn't so. I guess I knew that right from the start. How can you say that? After all the plans we've made. A big house, fine clothes, the best carriage in town. The governor's mansion. Those were your plans, Jerome, not mine. Well, what's wrong with that? Why do you object to those things? Mary Parson couldn't get them for you, could she? I told you to forget about Mary Parsons. Can you forget her? She was nobody. She was cheap. She was trying to blackmail me. She was going to go to you. You killed her. No, no, no. It was an accident, sweetheart. We, we went for a ride. It'll be all right. I'll, I'll win the case. Little Joe will go free, and, and we can get all the things that we've always wanted. What are you going to do? I'm going to tell my father. Betty May, I couldn't let you do that. I couldn't let you do anything like that. Betty May. Betty 
Anthony May. Right there, Cartwright. Don't move. You want to see your paw, don't you? Move. <laughs> What's this all about, Pa? Oh, these stupid people think they can take the law into their own hands. We don't think it, we know it. We're gonna move on that jail, take out your son and string him up. Little Joe didn't kill your Mary. We got the proof. There's a bill of sale for a paint pony. Let's see. Here's one for a left-handed holster signed by John Solly. Jerome Bell. That's right. Do you believe us now, Jake? I hope this ain't a Cartwright trick. All right. We're gonna pay a visit to Mr. Jerome Bell. All right, boys. I think I could ever get used to living in there? Good to have you out, Joe. <laughs> oh, I don't know. It's been kind of peaceful around the Ponderosa the last couple of days. <laughs> <laughs> Little Joe. 